When most fans think of the best moments of the Daytona Summer Race, the 2001 Pepsi 400 comes to mind immediately. It was arguably the greatest moment in NASCAR history. But many don't talk about the year afterwards at Daytona, in the 2002 Pepsi 400. The 2002 season to this point had been a wild one, with plenty of winners to go around. But the super speedways were a bit different from 2001. The rules packages had changed year over year, and if Talladega, the last restrictor plate race before this one, proved anything, it was that the DEI cars would be the ones to beat. In the 2002 Aaron's 499, DEI cars led 147 of the 188 laps run. Also, Dale Jr. and Michael Waltrip, they wound up 1-2. Up at the front of the pack, to start the race, though, would be RCR driver, Kevin Harvick. Look at him, look at him, look at him, boys! Take her down in the first turn! Jeff Gordon on the start of the race in the 24 car. He looked like he almost got knocked below that yellow line. You heard Jeff Hammond in the pre-race talk about the out-of-bounds. You can't be below that yellow line anywhere around this racetrack. And the, and the thing about it is you can't be patient if you're middle of the pack back. You've got to get up in there and get after them because you want to get with some cars that are fast. Two wide middle of the pack, three abreast in the back of the pack. This is the eye of the storm. That's what you got to watch for right there. That's where the action is. And, and, and the, this racetrack is wide enough to run three wide. It's wide enough to almost run four wide on the back stretch. The problem is on the exit of the corners, it's like running into a funnel. The racetrack narrows up. Here they come as they exit off the corner. And what happens is the cars move around. When there's this many cars around each other, the wind is buffing the car around. You're three wide. The wind catches the front of your car, lifts it up and into the car. Outside of you, you go. One of the front runners of this season, Tony Stewart, would be the first to get in trouble. After only finishing two laps at Daytona in February, this was oddly similar luck out only once again two laps in. Kevin Harvick once again led him to the green. In the back, cars got together due to a restart stackup, but the silver and black Goodrun Chevy minded not as he would lead ahead of Jeffrey Bodine. Though, once again, the green flag conditions wouldn't last that long. Far up high going into turn three. Oh, wall behind you. It's Johnny Benson. Boy, Benson. Stay up there. Stay up there. Hold it up there. Can't. Don't come down. Everybody gets up. Oh, man. Got another car smoking coming off the corner here. Caution waving as they come to the line. And the car That's smoking Kenny is Schrader. Kenny Schrader, Benson's teammate. Now, a possible reason for this is that there had been no practice before this race, which in 2002 standards is incredibly alien. Unfortunately for Benson, this would continue his nightmare 2002 campaign. Once again, Kevin Harvick brought him back to the green, this time more cleanly. Using the lap car of Ken Schrader, Jeff Gordon actually drafted past Harvick though. Gordon was in the midst of one of his longest winless streaks in his career, 24 races, so he was hungry for the victory. But once again, the green would not be here to stay. He and uh, I believe it's Todd Bodan. Or, uh, so, oh, here it goes. Trouble. Car. Hard in the wall goes Mike Wallace. Scoots across into the grass and half the field goes to pit road to take evasive action. To say the start of this race was chaotic would probably be an understatement. Luckily, this once again didn't lead to the dreaded big one. Unlike the other cautions, though, a majority of the field pitted. With a few only stop, Dale Earnhardt Jr. took the lead of those who pitted. The crowd of over 150,000 plus went nuts. They were pretty raucous on this night. For the ensuing restart, Jeff Burton led the race. This would be a lead that he would hold all the way up until the lap 25 competition caution. Even after the caution, though, Jeff Burton led, while Jeff Gordon dove down to the pits with a flat tire. For the first time all night, the race had calmed, as much as an early 2000s restricted plate race could. With this, much of the pack lined up in a train. No need to mix it up and junk your car this early into the night. The front pack wouldn't make much noise. 
the big story was Jeff Gordon desperately trying to get back on the lead lap. Up front, the lead changed once again as the silver bullet of Sterling Marlin stole the lead from the sit-go forward of Jeff Burton. While Marlin led the point, most were thinking about his last visit to Daytona, where he lost the lead in the Daytona 500 due in part to getting black flagged for his impromptu adjustments during the red flag. So, redemption was on the mind of the Ganassi driver. By the 50th lap mark, he did overtake Jeff Gordon, lapping his silver and blue Pepsi Chevy. The pack in this time had separated as well. In the Gen 4 days, this was normal in the Pepsi 400 for good handling cars to break away from the others. Behind Marlin, the DEI teammates of Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Michael Waltrip were linking up. Behind the pack as a whole, another caution flew. This offered the opportunity for Gordon to race his way back on the lead lap. Marlin would not grant his championship rival this kind of bone though. But either way, after the 30 lap green flag run, it was once again time to pit. 35 cars sped to their pit boxes. This could be a huge deciding factor of the night. As the DEI pair of Waltrip and Earnhardt sandwiched Dale Jarrett in the top three. With Waltrip's DEI Chevy up front, it may have just turned out to be a race for second. Scratch that. Maybe it was a race for third, as the 8 car got behind the 15 car. With the race in control, the DEI cars really calmed down the front to mostly a single file race all around. The most compelling story was really just how Jeff Gordon did everything he possibly could to get back on the lead lap. The DEI cars making it known that they were going to keep him a lap down. Because why would they give their number one rival at these tracks any added extra help? Gordon would fight back with 60 to go, stranding Dale Earnhardt Jr. to the outside lane. The calm was over for the time being. And this kept going all the way to the green flag pit stops with just under 50 to go. For the most part, everything went well. The winning fight cycled out between the DEI boys and Sterling Marlin. With around 40 to go, the damaged car of Tony Stewart caused the sixth caution of the night. This led to another restart, racking up the pack, and also leading to probably one of the most, if not the most, pivotal moment of the night. Jeff Gordon in 32nd place. One Whoa, there, there you go. There you go. This is it, guys. Jared Nemechek, Jeff Burton, Mike Skinner. It's one over. Car hard up into the wall. Joined by another. And they just keep wrecking. And the hits keep on coming. And the big hit was Joe Nemechek, Brent Bodine on fire. Leaders will have to race back to the caution flag. Here comes, I think this is Sadler again. It is Elliot Sadler. Yeah, but here comes Gordon back, back right back here behind him. Yeah, they're off the 24 turn four. car right there. He's trying to get his lap back as well. Elliot Sadler looks like he will accomplish it. Jeff Gordon will not. And I don't think Michael Walker, you mentioned it, Daryl, had a problem giving that 21 car lap back. 15 cars were involved in the big one. With the herd thinned, the field restarted with 15 to go. The eight team, though, was pressuring Dale Jr. to go for broke for the win. Teammates be damned. And he was going to do it. And with a debris yellow with nine to go, it looked like he had one last shot to get Mikey. The field went green. If you're going to do it, you got to do it now on this restart. You got to do it right now. The group back there about 11th and 12th. Jeff Green and Stacey Compton, the only cars right now stepping out of line, the 30 and the 14. Rusty had some help. Now he's in a good spot to get a big, strong run off the of turn two, but he's sitting in it. He's kind of in the cradle right there. He's got nobody to help him. But here comes Newman up with Wallace trying to help. Matt? Well, Dale Earnhardt Jr. is trying to get the two to help him, but apparently Rusty Wallace is running warm, so he won't stay tucked up underneath the eight of Dale Earnhardt Jr. In fact, Jr. spotter Ty Norris about broke his radio, jumping all over Wallace's spotter to try to help the eight. Boy, Rusty just put a block on his own teammate, and, I, and now it's going to cost him. 
But the good news for Michael and Dale Jr. is they're just pulling away. They stack up behind as Marlin has the inside. Mark Martin clawing for track position and Mayfield on the outside in that red dot. Well, the trouble is these two cars right here. I mean, they don't want to work together. They, they might be teammates, but somebody needs to tell them. Yeah, I mean, as long as they run side by side, I don't think one that gives no one to Dale Earnhardt Jr. to help go around Michael, but it's the greatest thing that can happen for those two guys up front. I mean, look where Michael and Dale Jr. are, and we're coming down here with five to go. And look at this wide behind them, Daryl. You talk about teammates, you do have Sterling Marlin in the 40 car. You have his teammate back there, Jimmy Spencer, in the 41 car. And Jimmy Spencer, he he dodged the big one. He's up there running in fifth right now. Well, they get sorted out here at the front. Uh, I think everything will work out fine. But, boy, Oof. Ryan Newman and Rusty were really going at it. Three wide all the way from 10th place on back. Four laps to go. Well, Jeff Bodine gets into time. They saved it. Holy cow. That's as close as you can come to wrecking with that. Uh oh, and here goes Junior by Michael. Now, where's Rusty going to go? Looks like he's going to stay with Michael on the bottom. Sterling Marlin, the 40. He's going to stay with Rusty. They're going to keep trying to run the back. There's another car about to you, Cars are all over the place again. Ryan is in the 12 car. Dave Blaney in the 77 as well. And they're racing back to the caution. And this could be the race. And here comes Sterling making a run. They'll come to the flag with three to go. Michael Waltrip leading them home. Rusty Wallace looking for his first Daytona win. Here they come to the caution flag. And this could be the race. I don't know there'd be enough time to throw a red flag. Because we have three laps to go. Junior had tried and had failed to get the lead. Instead, Waltrip raced to the caution flag with the lead while the eight fell to sixth. With the rules of having no green-white checker finishes at this time, it was all but certain that the race was over, and the raucous crowd slowly learned the truth, each lap slowly ticking off the scoreboard. It was a formality that the finish would go unresolved. Some few fans began to file out. Others were not as civil. You'd have to beat them the long way around on the outside. You're riding with them, aren't you? Well, I can't think about, I can't help but think about when we were here last. Which was February a year ago. He won. He went to Victory Street. That's right. But uh, it's a day that we'll, none of us will ever forget. Here we are back here for the first time since then. First Our time Fox race. has been back. First time Fox. Michael Waltrip wins the Pepsi 400. All right, way to go, buddy. <laughs> Rusty Wallace. Second, Sterling Marlin, Jimmy Spencer, Mark Martin. The top five. Boys, man, took my dad to, to show me what a half inch wrench was. I didn't know nothing. And uh, my dad, I tell you, all, all of him and uh, Dick McCabe and Kelly Moore back home for giving me the chance to do this. And uh, Teresa and Ty and Steve Mill and Richard Gilmore and Michael Walter. You know, I mean, a lot of people didn't believe in Michael, and I did. As Darrell Waltrip spoke careful and calm words, the fans at Daytona's Superstretch chaotically and angrily threw chairs and beer cans from their seats onto the track. Unsurprisingly, the broadcast really shied away from showing or mentioning the chair incident. But in the years since, some have brought this moment up as one of their either most disgusted or greatest comedic moments of pleasure in this series. So now, that's where I want to leave this off with you. What do you think of the fans reacting in this way? Do you think it's funny? Do you think it's stupid? Let me know down in the comments below. And while you're at it, leave a like on this video, share this video, and subscribe to the channel for more great NASCAR content. And to those of you who support the channel through channel memberships, I want to extend another big thank you to all of you. So until next time, have a good one.